Assalamu alaikum, welcome to California Care. Uh, today I wanted to address an old issue somebody has raised in the Improvision Group regarding endodontic diagnosis and how to make, make an assertion of what to do on a tooth which is symptomatic or possibly asymptomatic. So let's get the basics out of the way. Endodontic treatment is necessary whenever the pulp of tooth structure is involved. It could be a pediatric tooth, it could be an adult tooth. It can vary anywhere from putting calcium on an unexposed pulpal tissue and waiting for the secondary dentin to heal. That's also pulp therapy, uh, very minor and very delicate and very non-aggressive, very conservative pulp therapy. But nonetheless, it is pulp therapy, all the way to doing an apigorectomy procedure in which you go in and surgically remove the apical portion of the root and uh, you do treatment or it could also get into the aspects where you have perforation and you're trying to repair a perforation. So the field is very vast, but we are going to try to focus on determining what to do, when to do, and why to do. If I come across a, a tooth in which uh, we have periapical radiolucency and it has very large decay, then it, in a way it is pathognomonic to me that the pulp has been exposed and now not only do you have an endodontic lesion, but you also have periapical periodontitis. That means the apex of the root is involved and the bone is dissolving and the alveolar process is in danger there. So what you would need to do would be to clean up the endodontic portion of the tooth by taking away all the necrotic pulp tissue, but also do periapical stimulation and lavage possibly to wash away the infection that might be residing in periapical region wash it away and introduce a bit of calcium hydroxide to, with the basic pH, it would uh, kill the bacteria, work as an antibiotic, and also supply calcium for rebuilding the bone there by the body itself. Having said that, come back to the other lesion in which you have a large lesion, there is no periapical radiolucency, the tooth is not sensitive to palpation or percussion. The tooth could be sensitive to cold, it could be sensitive to heat, a patient could have reported problems with pain when they're eating something sweet. But all of these tests uh, could be false positive and false negative. So when I'm removing the decay, I do not assume just because on the basis of radiograph. If you'll take a look at the radiograph, in a radiograph, this would seem like all the fingers are touching. And they might be touching. But the same picture could show that the fingers are not touching. You just have a different perspective on a radiograph, facial lingually, and that's all you see. You do not see if the decay is actually touching the nerve. So this would be the analogy right here. Maybe the decay is touching the nerve, and maybe it is not. But radiographic appearance would be the same. So even if the radiographic appearance shows me that the decay is ending up in the pulp tissue, I do not presume this to be an endodontic procedure. The first principle of endodontic treatment is that you have to remove all restoration and all existing decay. So what I would do is I'd be very careful and use a large spoon excavator and excavate the lesion out. And a lot of times what I do notice is if this is the pulp chamber, the decay in a way is all around it without penetrating the pulp chamber. This is where the reparative dentin has been laid by the body itself. So radiographically, it might show that the decay is entering the pulp chamber, but in actuality, the decay is far away. So this would be the analogy that we would use. Once I would have removed the whole decay, and I don't even see the pink of the pulp chamber, I would still, in the deepest part, put a little bit of calcium hydroxide and put a restoration up on top by sealing the whole tooth. And I would make the patient aware that I was very close to the pulp in case the, the nerve chamber uh, was exposed, I could not find it visibly, clinically, and it would be all that might be needed as far as the restoration is concerned, but in case you have other symptoms, in case uh, the necrosis develops or irrevers irreversible pulpitis happens, or you have periapical lesion, we would not need to do any root canal treatment. Then you'd reevaluate them uh, first time in three months, then maybe a year later or two years later, and many a times in the past, that treatment has been sufficient in itself. So I would not rely upon radiographic decay touching the radiographic pulp chamber. And that's the first thing. To, to sum it up, use spoon excavator to clean it out and take care of it. Now, in case I'm using spoon excavator and I see the pink of it, pink of the pulp chamber, I would excavate more and if the dentin is still soft, 
then that means actually you're already in the pulp chamber and you might want to think about doing an indirect pulp cap. You can read up a little bit more about it, but that would be the indication to me to do indirect pulp cap, where I see the pink of the pulp, yet it is not exposed clinically, soft dentin is all removed, and I would have to assume that maybe the pulp is now fighting the infection, the micro-infection it might be having. I would give the patient some antibiotics for a few days, like three days or so, just as a backup, and that would take care of it. Now, in case I'm excavating and everything ends up in the pulp chamber and you see bleeding spot, then that is pulpal exposure. Now, it did not happen because of my error. It happened because the soft, the, even the roof or the chamber or the walls of the pulp were still decayed and I was removing the soft decay with a spoon excavator, not with a handpiece, not with a bird, no other mechanical means except but a large spoon excavator, not even a small one, and I'm not going around poking it with an explorer either. In that case now, the judgment call would have to come in, would you do root canal treatment or would you do a direct pulp cap? There are studies uh, in journals and books of endodontics that support both judgment calls. Uh, some studies do say, yes, you can go ahead and do a direct pulp cap and the tooth would survive. Some say even if you do on an adult tooth, the chances of survival are very low. So I'm not going to get into that discussion today. We're talking about just a diagnosis of it. And um, one of the things that I have come across is that if you, if you rely upon hot test, cold test, even electric pulp test, or uh, uh, pain to touching with the burr, all of those tests, like I said earlier, could be false positive or false negative. One thing that kind of goes well is percussion test, not palpation, but percussion. So you go ahead and take the back of a mirror and you tap the whole quadrant, one tooth at a time. Even if the patient is saying that my tooth hurts right here in premolar or molar region, I would start out with the canine or the central, do a little bit of tapping, tap, tap, tap on the tooth and tell the patient, well, this is normal, it doesn't hurt you, does it? And they would tell you, no, it doesn't. So I would tell them, wherever it hurts, raise your finger or raise your hand. Now that I'll be able to see that in my peripheral vision. So I go around, around tapping the canine, then the first premolar, then the second premolar, and then maybe the molar, first molar, second molar. And whichever tooth has periapical lesion, tapping it would elicit pain. And that to me is almost pathognomonic that the, the, that tooth is pulpally involved, and endodontically involved, and I would need to do something about it. There is one exception to me. If the tooth has had a crown done or a restoration done recently, then I would fault that crown or that restoration first and I would look for high spots. High spots do not have to be only on fun functional cusp, but they could also be on non-functional cusp, especially during bed and shift. So I would take an articulating taper and check it out. And if I see a slight bullseye anywhere, I would adjust it to make sure that that particular tool that was sensitive to percussion is no longer sensitive to percussion. Mm -hmm. And I would make sure that I go into lateral excursions also. One thing that helps at this time is to have shim stock. Normally the articulating paper that we use has a thickness of 80 to 120 microns. Shim stock has a thickness of about 8 to 12 microns. So I would use shim, shim stock and hold it on the tooth in question and have the patient bite down hard and try to pull the tooth put the shim stock out. If the shim stock pulls out, that means you have an occlusion which is in negative 10 microns. Now that hypo occlusion, not hyper, but hypo occlusion is almost theoretical. 10 microns cannot be felt by the patient. It is not going to jeopardize their chewing or anything of that sort. So I would utilize shim stock to also check the hyper occlusion, adjust that first, maybe give them one anti-inflammatory medication, uh, possibly naproxen sodium, 200 milligram, for that night just to take them through and then check them again the next day. Having said all of this, no matter which tooth hurts and no matter what I'm doing, I always pick up my piezo instrument and I scale the tooth and two or three teeth adjacent to it, two in front and two in the back. I have noticed a lot of times there could be some food particle, especially like the skin of popcorn or some spice that might have slid down into the periodontal ligament area, into the sulcus, and would be causing inflammation and pain to the patient. Cleaning can never hurt the tooth. It can never hurt the patient. So if you're doing a little bit of scaling with a piece of instrument all around that tooth and the adjacent two or three teeth, 
then you're not doing any disservice to the patient. You're not complicating the case. You're only actually making it better. So that is what I would recommend. No matter what you're doing, you're doing a single restoration, you're placing a bracket on a tooth for, for orthodontics, you're doing endodontic procedure, you're doing crown prep, whatever you're doing, scale that quadrant. Do a little cleaning in that region. And that would only be beneficial to the patient for them to heal up in an optimum condition. Um, in an earlier video, we talked about the analgesics. Um, in another video that I'll make shortly, I'll go ahead and talk about the analgesic regimen that we use at California Care, and we've been using it very successfully for a multitude of procedures in which the patient stays comfortable during the procedure, after the procedure, and they recover just fine. I hope this helps, and if you have any questions, feel free to send me a message on WhatsApp, plus 9232144. 61377. And just as a last note, this is a COVID season right now. Uh, today is 19th of April, Sunday, and things are in full bloom, unfortunately. So I plead to you, I request you, it's better to be safe than sorry. Do not take a chance on your life. Keep yourself and your loved ones in safety. I'm also sitting in the front yard, enjoying the time right before the sunset, doing some barbecue. The neighbor's chicken is creaking. Uh, is is um, uh, making the noise. Maybe one day we'll eat that too. Welcome to the barbecue.